for a long time, even after coming out. Um, you know, I still, you know, have trouble in the bedroom sometimes. But sometimes I have like uh, issues with vulnerability. Sometimes I have issues with like uh, not being able to um, perform certain acts because of trauma. You know, it's it's a whole big weird thing, but. Um, I will say that learning how to talk about it in a way that's not shameful, um, in a way that like is full of grace and compassion for myself, has really allowed me to now have some really, really positive sexual experiences um, and really positive relationships. Hi, I'm Isaac Archuleta, founder and CEO of I Am Clinic, an outpatient psychotherapy practice in Denver, Colorado. Welcome to Queer Relation Tips, a podcast devoted to helping you create the love lives and relationships you crave. In this episode, I talk with Kevin Garcia. Kevin is a seminary student living in Atlanta, Georgia. He's a life coach, a spiritual director, a content creator, and a queer person of faith. He's the author of Bad Theology Kills and host of a podcast called A Tiny Revolution. You can find more about Kevin and his exquisite work at thekevingarcia.com. In this episode, Kevin and I talk about a variety of topics, including religious trauma, sexual trauma, his first boyfriend, and his experiences with dating. He is also very open about his mental health and personally, as someone who has seen thousands of clients over the past 10 years, it makes me happy to know others can hear his story and maybe feel a little less alone in the world. I hope you enjoy our conversation. My first book is called Bad Theology Pills, An Antidote to Toxic Christianity. And in there, I'm tackling all the bullshit theology that we grew up with. Um, and more, like, basically more, more better, more better ways. Because there's already better ways in place, but here's like some more better ways to interpret um, faith things and uh, that kind of journey. So if that's your if that's your your, your tea, you know, come on, flip it. Love it. Awesome. Tell me a little bit about what theology did to you. Why this book? Oof. I think a lot of it had to do. Um, honestly, like I think a lot of my own uh, self-imposed oppression came from a damaging theology around sex and relationship and bodies. Mm. Um, you know how we arrange our relationships, how we uh, think about sexual pleasure. Um, it was all um, you know we were I was handed a script, and that script was that sex was only acceptable between one man and one woman in the covenant of marriage. Mm-hmm. And so anything outside of that is bad, is sin, it's against God. Um, and for people who experience, um, you know, because sexuality, we now you know and have learned is so much more than just wanting someone to stimulate your genitals, but it's like a whole part of your person. Mm-hmm. We, we, you know, it's not so much that like, you know, we wanted to do something bad it's that we felt we were something bad. Mm -hmm. Um, and so for a long time, even after coming out, um, you know, I still, you know, have some trouble in the bedroom sometimes, but sometimes I have like, uh, issues with vulnerability. Sometimes I have issues with like, uh, not being able to, um, perform Mm -hmm. certain acts because of trauma, you know, it's, Mm -hmm. It's a whole big weird thing, but um, I will say that learning how to talk about it in a way that's not shameful, um, in a way that like is full of grace and compassion for myself, has really allowed me to now have some really really positive sexual experiences um, and really positive relationships. It's like, wow, is this what um, maturity is? Is that what this is? Is this what healing looks like? You know, four years of therapy and, met, and a couple months later, you know. It took work, but um, for sure, I'll Absolutely. say like it took a long time for me to recover from you know toxic theology mm-hmm. about bodies and sex. Yeah, what were some of the most devastating one-liners, if you will, around your body and sex itself? Ooh, it's actually something that I, I remember. My mother said this to me. She said, "Kevin, uh, don't have sex 
uh, with a girl. So this, this was my, her version of the talk. It was like, Kevin, don't have sex with a girl because uh, it means more to a girl than it does to a boy. And so for me, I was under the impression that I was, uh, I somehow, like somehow like my sexuality was already like lessened. Mm-hmm. Like my ability to feel love was lessened because uh, I was identified as a male. Um, and sex didn't mean quote unquote that much. To yeah, you. it wasn't supposed to mean, but, but all I wanted to do was like have deep connection with someone. Like right. I was a very, very like emotional, very like, you know, you know, and I think that's true of a lot of queer people that we just have this increased emotional intelligence and desire earlier in life. Don't quote me on that. I'm not a psychologist, but that's just an idea I have. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, I think that was one of them. The, I think a lot of the, the purity culture teachings around, um, what was it? Things like, um, God, uh, the way that we talk about virginity, like how your virginity could be ruined. Right. Uh, should you like have sex before you're married or anything like that? Uh, having sex before you're married. Um, do you remember? Oh, go ahead. I was going to say the last one is that um, gay people get AIDS and die. Yes. That's what I also heard. For sure. But that was like the big one. Right. Do you remember what you were taught that would be damaged if you have sex before marriage? What What is damaged? What is damaged? Um, your honor. Okay. Like the Lord, the Lord knows what you did. Mm. It, it wasn't ever anything specific. They would just be like, you know, it was, it was, I think it was just like, like, it was a shame-based thing. Sure. You know, it's just like, it's not so much that it's like, you lost honor mm-hmm. in some way. Or you lost like, your purity, your standard. There's nothing, but they could never point to anything concrete. Like, right. you know, for, especially like for, um, you know, for a guy who I identified as a boy and, you know, boys didn't have any, you know, boys didn't have a hymen because obviously a broken hymen is proof that someone's had sex. But that's not all that we know. That's also like scientifically untrue as well. Sure. So yeah, they never really point to anything. It's just like, this is how it's done. This is how you're blessed. And if you don't do it this way, then you're not blessed. You're outside of God's will. You can get cursed and get pregnant, and have babies and STIs. All mm-hmm. that shit. Yeah. I had one client tell me a story where his Sunday school teacher uh, drew a heart on the board and filled this heart in with chalk. And she said, every time you sleep with someone and then she would swipe away a piece of the heart, she would say, you're giving yourself away. And if you ever kiss someone, yeah. she would swipe a little chunk of the heart away. And it was this idea that you were mm-hmm. this um, this fixed amount of love or relationality yeah. or purity and the more times you kissed or had sex with someone, the more that level of purity depleted. And when it was gone, you mm-hmm. weren't pure anymore. Yeah. And you could never get it back. Which but also, like, I don't know if they did this where you were, but they like said like, oh, but he's a born again. Like he's a born again virgin. <laughs> sure. I'm like, what does that mean? <laughs> That's not biblical. Yeah, for real. Not biblical. Yeah. Oh, the things we come up with. Oh my God. Yeah. What do you feel like were some of the long lasting effects of that. I mean, if I'm carrying around this message that says mm-hmm. I am now immoral, I don't have integrity or I'm not pure. I'm not a pure person. What do you think that did to your mental health? What did that shame do? Mm. Uh, I know for me in college, um, I was kind of half in and half out of the closet. So um, like I'd be in church I'd be mm-hmm. at church and like, you know, been on the worship team and, you know, volunteer with the youth group. And I would also go out partying with my fraternity and like kiss whatever boy was at the party. And so it was kind of a, I was kind of leading a double life in some ways. I was one person at church and one person in front of my fraternity brothers and one person in front of my family. So the current pe- compartmentalizing. Yeah. Yeah. Super big into the compartmentalizing. And it caught up with me. Um, my junior year, I started having, I started getting set up like, like, panic attacks mm-hmm. um and uh, insomnia was pretty that was pretty heavy uh i like i started abusing drugs when i was in college i'm specifically like painkillers and opiates mm-hmm. um because i just 
you know, I was trying to like not feel a lot of things. And like the thing about me is like, I'm a Scorpio. I feel very deeply. Mm-hmm. <laughs> not that, um, but that, uh, it, it, that's, I think it was like this constant feeling of like being at odds with myself of like, I'm not supposed to want this, right. but I do. Right. And no matter what I try, no matter how I, you know, try to pray this away, no matter how much time I spend in church, like I still want to kiss a boy. I still feel this like romantic drive to connect with, with bodies that look like mine. Mm-hmm. Almost as though your desire, your own desire was your own enemy. Oh, 100%. And like, that's another thing too, is that desire itself was like a, something the devil could use to trick you into also mm-hmm. like desire was like your body, anything that came from the flesh was meant to be distrusted. Right. Was like fallen, was not of like, and so it's amazing. Like the, the human, the human mind can totally separate itself from the body, sure. but the body will not shut up. Like mm-hmm. the body still has to live in this world. And if you're not paying attention, it, you know? Absolutely. And if the desire to fall in love is something wrong to be held by a man, to share romance with someone of the same gender, mm-hmm. I can't imagine what falling in love would feel like in that context. Mm-hmm. I mean, like, I, when I was in college, the, I had my first boyfriend. And we were each other's first boyfriend too. Mm -hmm. And both kind of having like, it was so cute. Mm -hmm. I also called him one time. I was very stoned one night and I called him and I said, Hey, do you want to like be on a podcast with me and talk about our failed relationship? (laughs) Because it was like both of our first ones and like where we are now. I think it would be really interesting. He did not call me back. Oh, Um, but uh, you know, Greg, if you're out there listening, Mm -hmm. um, I'm still open to it. Um, (laughs) Anyways, so we were each other's first um, for a lot of things, and we dated for three months, and we actually did not have sex. We like oral, um, but like we didn't do uh, any penetrative uh, sexual activities um, because we were both fucking scared shitless. Sure, what were you scared? Like, of? And all, um, I was afraid that like, it was going to hurt. I I also um. It's really in, uh, not really interesting. So um, I didn't realize until two years ago that I was sexually assaulted in high school. Mm. And so um, I never really enjoyed performing oral sex. And I, like, I can only do it for a small amount of time before like, my body just felt sick. Sure. And I did not, and I did not understand why. Mm. Fast forward, you know, to a couple years ago, I'm in bed with my partner uh, at the time. And something just clicks and I'm right there and I remember and I'm like, oh my God, this happened to me. Right. And that's why I didn't want to, I haven't ever wanted to do this. Um, I guess that's also like a small, you know, no small detail. Right? Just, um, you know, just hanging out detail. there on the margin, that little, little piece of information. Yeah. Yeah. Small little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't remember the actual, oh, the, so there, there was that. It was like, we were both scared. And I also had unresolved and unrecognized trauma. And also, like, even if I did remember, even if my brain didn't do the vanishing act on my memory that it did in order for me to survive, Mm -hmm. who would I have talked to about that? Sure. Right. There was no resource to say, hey, like, someone has, like, forced me to, you know, perform all effects on them. Like, you know, I believe that. Uh, absolutely. And I think that that's a very unfortunate, dare I call it, it's minimizing, but a side effect of theology, to use your language, theology that kills. Not only does it literally kill when we think mm-hmm. about suicide, but it's right. killing the safety and the relational intimacy for children to have a safe resource in their parents to say, this is where I went in the exploration or the expression of my sexuality and I was traumatized but because you believe a certain thing, you're not safe for me to be safe with you. Right. And that's God. so damaging for us as queer youth or children coming out and discovering trauma. And in some yeah. ways, can, it, it almost feels inevitable for many of us. Yeah. 
it's so wild. It's so it's it's so interesting because like now on the other side of these things, like I only can imagine. And I think it's very interesting too because I feel like I've had like almost um, been on a fast forward button Mm -hmm. like in the past four years of like coming out and you know leaning into all the work that i'm going to do and like leaning into the questions and also leaning into them very publicly um especially around sex and sexual expression i think that as scary as it has been to tackle these questions around sex and body and shame Um, the more I do, the more happiness I'm cultivating. Like, and, and, and I think that's something I'm really thinking. I've been in therapy for two years now, like consistently. And, you know, I'm going to stay with my therapist probably for the foreseeable future, just because she's brilliant. Um, but it it was I think the, the the reason I'm able to finally talk about these things is because I was able to really free myself from the shame I was feeling, and the shame wasn't just around like you know being gay. It was like it was a desire to love a certain mm-hmm. kind of person, exactly. and it was a desire to connect. And you know, I, I was ashamed of the fact that I wanted to kiss a boy. I was ashamed mm-hmm. of the fact that I wanted to wear a dress, that I wanted to put on makeup, that I wanted to. Uh, express myself in a way that was different than the mythical norm Mm -hmm. that said this is how it's supposed to look this is how it's supposed to be done right and that's all that's all an illusion there's no should you know as a clinician i think it's so ironic and unfortunate that christians would say god is love but then christians would teach their queer children that the love that they bear, this image bearing is so shameful and dirty. I mean, Mm. we're, we're literally shaming the core of how children understand not only their sexuality, but their own ability to connect to another person. And when we shame that we're shaming who they are as relational people and we're relational people everywhere. Their bosses Mm -hmm. with our friends, with dating and, Hello, trauma. Yeah. And also, it, like, we kind of, like, I think to survive, like, you know, queer kids, and, like, at least I did this, like, we learned to really uh, kind of sever our sexuality from ourselves, or at least, like, we put it over there on the sin nature over there. And our sin nature is something that we're supposed to kill up there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I saw a tweet that Jackie Hill Perry put out a few weeks ago that says, not as maybe a few months ago. It's just like you know, uh, you you know your sin has an appetite. Kill it. And I was mm. like, girl, I don't think you know what you're saying, right? Um, because <laughs> and it's one of those things. This is another thing too that like I study different kinds of theology. The more I open myself up to. I've been reading A Course in Miracles a lot recently, and I've also been like getting to, into some Baha'i texts as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, but like one of the things that A Course in Miracles would say is that like we do not have a sin nature; we just make mistakes. You know, we make oh, errors. Yeah. But just like you know, like um, it's this idea of just like we, our, our actions are, are not sin so much as they are, you know. It's very interesting because like, I'm so classically trained in theology, so all these words have different meanings to me, and I'm still synthesizing them. But, but the whole point of that by changes just as sin. Mm-hmm. We have to stop seeing any desire because, like, yeah, sure, like, you know, we want to be sure to protect, like, the autonomy of every single person, and we don't have to, like, give in to every single desire that comes up in our body. Mm-hmm. But to to hold it and to give it uh, voice and to give it space and to say, okay, that's interesting mm-hmm. because it is like allowing our body to just be whatever they are and whatever our desires are, let them be what they are. Nine times out of ten, nowhere near as weird as you think it is. Someone else is thinking it too, and someone else is wanting it. Mm-hmm. 
Absolutely. Yeah. So. You're very open and public about your mental health journey in many ways. Um, and being so public about it across your pl- platforms, what is, what's your intention? What's your hope? My hope with sharing anything on the internet is that uh, if someone can have a moment where they can recognize that they're okay, recognize that they're not alone in whatever their struggle is. Um, you know, my mom, well, I've, I've been, I've been real sentimental recently. I've been thinking about my mama. Um, but she told me something. She said, there's new, there's no new story. It's just new characters. Mm. And so it's this idea that like throughout this great history, it simply repeats itself. The same. Like, there's nothing new under the sun. Right. It's all the same thing. Um, and like so I kind of, shit uh, isn't any, anything new or surprising. <laughs> yeah. It's like, honestly, like, you know, cause my story really is not that uncommon. If mm-hmm. we're going to be honest, like my story is one of a, of a thousands of stories that people are telling right. about mental health and queerness and all, everything that goes with that. Um, but for some reason or another, like, you know, maybe I kept doing it. Maybe I've just, I've annoyed enough people on the internet long enough that they're finally listening to them. Fine, we'll listen to you. I don't know. Um, but my intention is always like, I want you to be set free to tell your story too. Yes. I want people to know that like, it is so like, stop being ashamed of being human. Like, it, it, yes, it's fucking hard. Mm-hmm. And also you're doing really well. Mm-hmm. Like you're being the best human you know how to be. Um, and God's so in love with that. Right. And the reason I know that is because I'm in love with it. I'm in love with, with the person in front of me. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, uh, I, I think it's uh, being able to talk about mental health online, um, being able to talk about spiritual trauma online, is because um, it was because people who told their story online that I am still alive. Mm-hmm. And I would really, really like for more people to stay alive. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of really great things coming. Like AOC is going to be president one day. All of our student loans are going to get forgiven. Um, <laughs> you know, everyone's going to convert to like the one world religion or whatever. And then uh, we'll have electric cars. Such an optimist. I love your utopia. Yeah. You know, I'm just. Uh, maybe that's uh, an LSD dream, but you know, one can, <laughs> one can, one can, uh, one can dream. Exactly. Exactly. Cool. Mental health meds. Yeah. One of my favorite conversations. Yeah. How? I, you, oh yeah. Tell me, tell me about your experience. What have you learned? How has it helped? Eat your uh, apple, it's cool. It. Yep, you go for it. I needed a snack. Keep that, keep that insulin at um, healthy levels. Well, absolutely. Um, I, I, I'm pretty sure that I've struggled with anxiety and depression since I was in college, but I was definitely a high-functioning depressive person, mm-hmm. depressed person. I uh, still kind of am a high-functioning depressed person, but like meds have definitely helped my quality of life. Um, I started like there was, I was unable to get out of bed um, for a while. Um, just like I could get out of bed and I would go to work and then I would come home and just get back in bed. That was my, uh, and so I finally was able to get on some insurance because I wasn't able to afford a psychiatrist. So um, it was mostly just like, you know, using what mental health tools I had, the community around me. To really just like hold on, so I was able to get to a doctor. Um, my doctor put me on uh, Wellbutrin, and Wellbutrin was a really phenomenal choice for me because like he gave me the energy I needed to. It did have this very interesting side effect at first, though, where like I was getting like these anger spikes. Is like the best way I know how to describe them. Where one thing would set me off, and I'm talking like I would go to zero to ten, 
like into rage yeah. and not understand why mm-hmm. or why my body was there, or why my brain was freaking out. And back to the doctor, apparently, I'm not the only person who experiences that. Sure. And then uh, she added Zoloft to my little medicine, my little meds cocktail. Tell you what, within 24 hours, I felt. I did not realize that there was a low buzz of anxiety in my body for my entire life until it was gone. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I can think about one thing at a time. Do you know what it's like? Absolutely. That revelation is life changing. Yeah. And so it was one of those things where just like, Oh, like, yeah, sure. I've got like some attention span problems, but it's like, it's like, it was only exacerbated by my anxiety. Mm -hmm. So it, it, like, it really started to fix a lot of the issues. So now, like, I, I take two pills a day, and I, it, it, it's what's so amazing to me is that, I mean, meds are not magic. Mm-hmm. Um, I've said this on my Instagram before. Meds are not magic, but they allow me to work my magic. Yes. And what I mean by that is, like, the, like, the answer is not medication. Medication is a tool. Mm-hmm. The the answer is I'm still gonna show up and do my work. For sure. And that means like, you know, like it's because like um one of my friends, Candace Zubinat, said in a in a beautiful uh, thing she did one time, like a presentation, she said, Meds don't um get you to the goal, they get you on the same playing field as everybody else. So it's like, oh my gosh, now I'm on like this like level ground where right? everybody else. And I have the same tools and I'm sa- like the same starting line as everyone else. And so I can actually deal with my problems now. Right. Wow. Like my therapy, just like the, the, the amount of like spiritual and emotional progression I could make mm-hmm. because I had the brain space for it finally, because we got those chemicals a little bit better balanced out. Mm-hmm. Jesus wept. It was, it's been incredible. I'm glad. And so every single time I go, every time I go back to my psychiatrist, she's like, how are you doing? I'm like, great. She's like, no changes. I'm like, nope. And she's like, okay, here's your, here's your script. I'm like, thank you. Mm-hmm. Oh, what so, a life changer. What a life yeah. changer. And I'm not, and I'm not saying I'm going to be on meds for forever. I hope that like, perhaps I can transition off in one day. But at the same time, if I can't, mm-hmm. I don't see it as a weakness. Like, for sure. My brain just works differently than other people. I'm like, why wouldn't I want to give myself every tool I can? Right. Why wouldn't I want to give myself every advantage possible to have a happy life? Mm-hmm. Right. Relationships are hard. Family, partners, love, sex. Life can be overwhelming. Over the past 10 years, I've sat with individuals and couples and have heard stories of hurt and hardship, stories of struggle and pain. I've helped people explore questions about life. Queer Relationships is offering a unique opportunity to come on the show and sit with a therapist to talk about whatever you need help with. Relationship with your family, Rocky? Having trouble with your sex life? Considering an open relationship? Exploring your gender identity? Love life at a standstill? I'm here to sit with you and talk about it with hope that you will walk away stronger. For more information, visit imclinic.org. That's iamclinic.org. I have a couple more questions. Penny. For the kiddo who's 11, 12, 13, 16, mm-hmm. 19, growing up, in a religious environment, whether it's Christianity mm. or Buddhist family, whatever it might be. Right, right, right. If they're knowing that they're somehow or in some way part of the queer community, mm-hmm. what would you say to them? Oh, hello. First of all, hi. Mm-hmm. Um, that's what I would start off with because um, I'm very awkward in front of the people. <laughs> Uh, I would I would probably say the thing that I needed to hear at their age is that it is not always going to feel like this. Like if you're struggle, if like it's a struggle to live in your house with the kind of family and kind of environment you're in, it's not always going to feel this way. Mm-hmm. And it's going to like it might 
we, you know, a few years before you're able to get out of the house, leave town, go to college, whatever it is. And maybe like leaving isn't even an option for you. Maybe you're stuck right now. and You don't know how you're going to get out or change your life. Um, but I will say as somebody who, you know, moved to Atlanta with no money and lived in a shitty basement apartment for $300 in my pocket and like eating ramen, it's possible. Mm -hmm. And, and so I just want to say like you, you're going to be fine if you can continue to press in, if you can continue to hold on and not to mention like as you're able connecting with LGBTQ people online is a lifesaver of a mind. Like it's, it'll save your mind. It'll save your heart. So don't be afraid. Even if like you have to create a pseudonym to connect with people online for safety reasons, so many people have done that and it's still just as valid. Mm -hmm. So reach out in whatever way possible. If you are struggling with mental health, reach out to the Trevor Project so that they can talk to you through that. But we need you to stay alive. Yes. Because um, the revolution is not going to win itself, baby. Right. If you, as a 12-year-old, were going to look down the path that you were about to trot, knowing what you know now, what mechanisms people events, successes came to you that really helped you feel so confident in who you are mm -hmm. and how you love yourself? Um, so like, what were the, are you asking like, what are like the key moments that happened that were like, and the key factors, the people, the successes? Right. Ah, yeah. I think this is my number one piece of advice for, um, for anyone, uh, who's working through their coming out process or um, I think actually just in life in general, uh, find your people. Mm -hmm. Like um, I think that queerness gives us a really, really beautiful gift. Because for me, queerness means breaking down every binary that separates us period. Mm -hmm. And so I think that like at large, you know, humanity at large. Yes. Yes. Humanity. Like not, not like, yeah, exactly. Uh, I think being able to find the people who can celebrate you for who you are and not in spite of who you are is crucial. I think a lot of times like we've also kind of been um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, what's that thing where you're you have been told you have to do these patterns? Conditioning? In, uh, conditioned! That's yes. the word. Wow. <laughs> Sorry, we've been writing uh, theology papers all day. Ah. Um, we've been conditioned to think that we're only worthy of certain kinds of things, certain kinds of love, certain kinds of people. Um, and so oftentimes it's just like, well, you know, these people are my family. And so we put up with their horrible uh, behavior towards us because they're my family and that's what I'm supposed to do. And um, I think being able to really know what you're worth what your boundaries are is going to be huge. So finding people is a huge thing. Um, I think uh, other successes were um, I, you know, I, I found a spiritual community that was very supportive of me. Mm -hmm. um, I also, and this, they and do I exist also, just to say <laughs> they do. They do exist. There are affirming spiritual, there are affirming spiritual communities. Like they're a lot more common. Well, I'll say this also, I, I live in a metropolitan city. Mm -hmm. um, so with that, like, um, certain advantages for the queer person versus someone who lives in a rural community. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not to say that, like, to live in a metropolitan area is normal. It's normative, but it's not normal. And to live out, in, like, I follow this really cool account called Queer Appalachia. And they have a, a lot to say about this, like, LGBTQ people living in non-metropolitan spaces. And I'm like, ah, it's so good. Um, but you thought you gotta find your people for sure wherever they are and for me it started out online mm -hmm. and that's why i'm still online mm -hmm. you know i'm trying to get more people absolutely it sounds like another big component of your success is therapy and mental health yes treatment. that uh, yeah if, if that wasn't already clear mm -hmm. um because i think that like whether we know it or not, like even if like you grew up in like a really phenomenal household with a super supportive everyone, being a person who's alive today, you probably experienced some kind of trauma. 
uh, because we live in a capitalist society that, you know, is, you know, turning our bodies into uh, machines rather than, you know, uh, deposits of the divine. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, or whether it's uh, messages about sex that you've internalized or messages about like your self-worth that you've internalized. Um, You're a queer person. You've been, like, I'm just saying, you're a queer person in the world. You got trauma. You need to go talk to somebody about it. You, and, you know, if you're out there and you're struggling to get out of bed, go talk to a psychiatrist. Get on some medication. It, the first one might not work. Try another one. Mm-hmm. Just, like, do the things you need to live. Right. It's, and, and it's so hard because, like, we're also, we don't, we're not taught to advocate for ourselves. Mm-hmm. We're taught to be codependent. Mm-hmm. We're taught to be codependent on churches, on families on lovers uh on on the approval of people on instagram and just like at the end of the day i think uh, oh actually i have three things that are like my my core things uh this is my practice of radical honesty one uh i'm always uh i'm always okay with saying how i feel and i will always own my emotions like my emotions are mine uh I can't, no one can make me feel any sort of different kind of way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, mean, I mean, sure, they can quote unquote piss me off, but like in the deeper sense of just like my emotions are mine right. and no one else is responsible for them. Mm-hmm. Two, uh, I always ask for what I need um, because I, and I also know that I'm responsible for getting my needs met. So it's like, if I want to ask my lover to be a certain thing for me, like, hey, I need you to listen to me rant about X, Y, and Z. Um, if they can't listen to me rant, what do I need to do? I need to go find someone else to get to, to listen to me, or I need to figure out how to self-soothe, or I need to figure out how to be there for myself in that moment. Um, or whether it's sexual, just like, hey, sweetie, I want this kind of sex thing. And if they agree, then, oh, sweet, then I'm getting my needs met. But if they say, hey, I don't want to do that, then my, but my question is, like, okay, well, like, what do I do with this desire then in light of my relationship? Right. Um, I know that like I can still get my need met and it might just change mm-hmm. a little bit. And the third thing, I'm always okay with asking for what I want because I am always okay with hearing no. And that's something I borrow from um, The Ethical Slot, a really, really phenomenal book. Um, but asking for what I want has changed my life um, because I'm no, it's like I am able to release all expectation of myself I'm able to release all expectation of other people. Um, I'm able to be more compassionate. Um, Cause I know that when people, like if I say, you know, for example, like I was out the other night and I met this really nice guy. And I was like, Hey, like, uh, I'd love to take you home with me. He's like, uh, you know, that's not really my thing. And I'm like, Oh, okay, cool. No big deal. And then we still had a great time made out a little bit. Got of remember the whole thing. But it's just like, I didn't feel any kind of like, Sure, he said no, but that doesn't mean like he's rejecting me. He's just rejecting a proposal of sexual intimacy. Sure. And that's fine. But that has nothing to do with my worth. That right. has to do with something we want to do together. Exactly. Or I want to do with them. It sounds like what you're doing kind of in my clinical language, we've touched on this just a little bit, but you're reclaiming your desire, your needs yes. and your wants, and you're owning them yes. as opposed to feeling them severed apart or off from you. Mm-hmm. It is one hundred. That is one hundred percent the case. Yeah. Like I do not. I see it, my desire as the the driving force in my own creative life. Mm-hmm. I see it honestly as a step in the coming out process to verbalize who I am, to let people see who I am, but then mm-hmm. to in my own body reclaim the desires of who I am. I think mm-hmm. is one of the final pieces of our coming out. Yes. Yeah. And really being able to own them without shame, which also takes work. Right. Because, totally. you know, when you're taught to, when you're taught to be ashamed of your desire, um, even as like liberated, you know, we've been out in town for years, people like, I still like have these moments where I get caught up in, uh, I mean, like body shame is like a real obvious one for me. Mm. Like I, um, uh, I, like, you know, my body does not look like the cover of men's health, mm-hmm. which yeah, is so interesting. It's like, yeah. And it's like, but my body still works really, really well. And mm-hmm. I'm still having sex with people who really like my body. So it's like, mm-hmm. can I, 
Can I believe what's in front of me? Mm-hmm. Can I believe the truth about who I am? Can I believe that when I say, you know, that my body is actually worth being desired? Like I am worthy of being desired and I'm also worthy of my own desire. Mm-hmm. Totally. It really, really starts to, it really starts to shift um, our whole life because not only like, you, can you like start getting like this uh, beautiful sense of intimacy that perhaps you weren't getting before, but um, I really think you, it's like, I'm fixing this relationship with myself. And then after that, every other relationship starts getting fixed because I know what I'm worth. I know what my boundaries are. I know where I'm pouring my energy. Mm -hmm. Um, And I know how to get what I want. And I know how to ask for what I need. Mm -hmm. It's a a wild thing with freedom situation. You're like a walking queer relation bundle of tips. Like you're just (laughs) full of them. If you're going to look down the road at your relationships moving forward, what's one challenge that you really want to tackle? For myself? Mm -hmm. Either your relationship with yourself or your dating life. Mm. The the one I'm actually, I know for myself, it is, I feel like uh, the past, the first year out of the closet was just like survival mode. And then like every year after that has like had this very interesting theme. So like at first it was like my mind. I'm going to get my mind right. I'm going to get all my ducks in a row, theologically or whatever. Um, and then this past, so like it was like mine. And then this past year was all about like trusting spirit and listening to, mm-hmm. you know, my, my personal practices and listening to where I'm feeling I'm being called. And I feel like this coming year, I'm turning 30, which I'm very excited mm-hmm. about. Um, yeah, line up boys. We're, we're out here. <laughs> um, I have, uh, <laughs> I have this sense that I'm, this is about a spirit, or mm-hmm. about body. This year is about body. Okay. And about really bringing it all together. So for me, um, I, I have a, med- a med- meditation practice that I'm very into. Um, I really want to create more of a physical practice. And by that, I mean, I actually want to work out. And, you know, I've got uh, this guy I'm seeing right now who looks like, Michael B. Jordan, and so like I gotta like keep up with that. Uh, yeah, that's hot. Yeah, mm-hmm. girl, let me mm-hmm. tell you. <laughs> let me it's tell probably you, probably one of the men on the top of my list. Just oof, <sighs> man. Jesus, hallelujah. Um, anyways, um, but really, like my my fear around my body has more been like I used to get panic attacks when I go to the gym. Mm-hmm. Like I would see all these like dudes who were just jacked who were, like. It was like the dudes who like wear those like skimpy tank tops and and like the platform hat low over their eyes with the big headphones, the, the Dr. Dre beats on their ears, lifting a thousand pounds over their head and like, you know, throwing a kettlebell across them. I don't know. Sure. But like I would I would get in my head and say like, oh my God, they, they're probably judging me because I'm over here using this machine instead of free weights or something like that. Yeah. And it went and like and it might spiral into a panic attack. Yeah. And so like I hated going to those spaces because that was made me feel that way. And so um something I've been working on is saying like Kevin, like, you know, we're worthy of moving your body. Mm. You're worthy of sweat. You're worthy of, you know, desire and also being desired for a certain kind of way. You 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 deserve to have the body that you want. You know, and to move in ways that make you feel good. And also like you know, if you end up looking sexy as a result, get it. Because mm-hmm. I'm already super sexy. I, I just need other people to realize I'm super sexy. Yes. Main thing. <laughs> I'm trying to. I'm trying to get a, you know, little little thought mess going on. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Yes, I hear you. So I, I think it's body is 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 one thing that I'm really working on. Just my relationship towards loving my body for what it is and everything that it could become. And I think the other one would be, or another one would be, um, continued radical honesty within romantic relationships, which can be really, really difficult because um, it requires totally. me being vulnerable, which I fucking hate. Mm-hmm. Like well, the fear of rejection, right, can keep us all silent. Yes, mm-hmm. and like especially with like things like asking for what I want. Mm-hmm. 
totally. It's like we're more. We got like. I was just gonna say we're more willing to protect the harmony of the relationship than we are to show up in it. Wow, sound by that. Oh, that's it. Mm -hmm. We're like, and that's what, and I think that's because like we've been taught to be codependent. It's just like it is more important for you to fulfill this role in what what is normative for society for you to be coupled or partnered and stick it out and work on it because that's what people do. Right. But like it's um it's so many people are just existing in it for the sake of it without actually and then like but everyone's miserable and nobody knows. Right. We think that working on it means not being selfish, which means shutting off what we really want, as opposed mm-hmm. to saying, I need to know what you really want and what I'm gonna put what yes. I really want and we fix it as a team. We're not taught mm-hmm. to deal with it that way. We're taught to just be passive and submissive and yeah. harmonious yeah it's and it's also this this lie or maybe like i think this is like the what we have whether or not we picked it up i don't know where we picked it up but like your partner should be your other half they should just understand you they should know like this was something um one of my exes was always mad at me for just like well you should just know you should know what i'm thinking like we've been together long enough you should know what i'm feeling i'm like mm-hmm. I told you at the very beginning of this relationship that I'm an idiot and I don't pick up on hints. Mm -hmm. I don't pick up on moves. I don't pick up on vibes. You know what I do pick up on? Direct communication. Right. Tell me what you want. Totally. What you're describing here is something we call negative control or prodding. It's whenever our partners poke at us, whether it's with a passive aggression, a a facial expression, the silent treatment, uh, do you Mm -hmm. love me? Anything that's designed to provoke us into soothing them. And we get trained to use negative control more than asking for what we want. Mm -hmm. Because we feel like we can't, we're not valuable enough to ask for it. So we have to poke it out of somebody. And this, I love your commitment to just radical honesty because it shifts the paradigm. Instead of using this manipulative negative control thing, it says, hey, I am fully present and I'm practicing mm-hmm. this undecorated vulnerability where you get to see who I am. Mm-hmm. And I think, I think, Kevin, that's just you're giving your relationship such a wonderful ability to thrive. Yeah. yeah. And it's scary because, you know, like, what if the thing I ask for is like the deal breaker? Mm-hmm. And then I have to right. decide, okay, do I, do I continue like pursuing this thing or is this relationship worth it? And that's a hard question to get to, but like, I'm glad I'm actually asking that because, and because like, and there's another, like, I think false perception too, is that like, uh, if I don't stick with my partner, if we break up, our relationship fails. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's always the case. I think that even me and my ex dysfunctional as we were, I don't see that as a failure of a relationship. Mm -hmm. I really loved him. I really like have so much of admiration and respect for him. And I also just know that for what, for all the reasons that we were not good for each other, like, you know, we needed to separate, mm-hmm. and, but I don't see it as a failure. And I think there's this thing of just like, who am I without X or what am I going to do? I mean, and, and like, there's this fear, like, what am I going to do without this person or this, this space? Like if you're, this is also of course of miracles coming at you real quick. Dude. This is what they would call like, um, I think I think the way that Western society like uh, kind of like idolizes this the romantic relationship like this person needs to be my all in all um, is you know in the Christian tradition we would call it idolatry in the Course of Miracles we call it special relationships and by special it means like to put somebody above myself mm-hmm. and to make the, basically to make them into an idol in a sense like I'm going you I give you, I love you so much I'm giving like I give you all this adoration so like in a romantic partnership for example seeing as them as like the source of where your happiness lies, putting all of your power and trust and like, you know, your existence into this one person. Then you all get divorced 29 years later and your whole world falls apart because you lost your source. Right. Because you, you gave your power away to somebody else. Right. Um, and we do this with celebrities. We do this with people on Twitter. And then, so we give our other jobs. people all this power and mm-hmm. at our jobs. Um, in religion sure you know you we give we we give all these different sources power 
Um, and then when they don't live up to the expectation that we have for them, we cancel them or we are hurt by them or we're devastated by them for sure. rather than saying like my source, my power lies within me, my ability to like, you are just another person having an experience in the world, naming what you want, totally. you know, asking for what you need. And if I can be honest with you and you, you can be honest with me, then like, there's nothing to be afraid of. Mm-hmm. Cause like my, uh, my only promise to anyone is like, I'm going to love you the best I can for as long as I have you. I'm pausing there on purpose because that was just incredible. It's like respecting their humanity rather than treating them like they're some sort of superhero. Yeah. You, yeah. You put to like, there is a, an art to like surrendering our expectations. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's not to say that we shirk responsibility or to say that like, you know, we don't show up for the people that we said that we're going to show up for. Like if you built relationship with someone, be in relationship with someone. Right. Um, but it's also like, I have like, uh, I mean, like I look at our friendship, for example, it's like, uh, I expect like, you know, like we'll keep in touch, like we'll let each other know like what's going on in our lives. Um, but also like that doesn't look like a, a regular communication schedule because like we live in two different cities we're both incredibly busy um and but like i know like when we come back together like we're gonna hit that Mm -hmm. because like i think sometimes like we have like these expectations and even within our friendships too of like my gang's gotta be my ride or die my gang's gonna like work up for me even perhaps if i like when i have problematic behavior my my, my crew's gonna like you know I, don't know, it's an, I think it's another form of codependency too. Sure. So it's like, cause like, you know, cause like what happens when your friends do something stupid mm-hmm. and get mad at you? What happens when you accidentally sleep with your friend's ex-boyfriend by accident because they was on grind and you just didn't know? Right. Yeah. It's, um, I don't know where I'm going with that. I think I've got off a rabbit trail. That's all right. The thing that I, that I'm hearing, if I can maybe summarize is, Allowing yourself to love some, allowing yourself to love the human that they are rather than the fantasy of who they can become and being so realistic with that, their shortcomings, their presence, and then their absence, um, their good behaviors and their hurtful ones. Like, and this to me sounds like unconditional love, loving the human rather than the fantasy. That's it. That's it. That's exactly it. It's like, and you see um when you see it as it actually is mm-hmm. like totally. and i think also like this allows has allowed me to have a lot of healing in all of my relationships across the board especially like, my relationship with my father who super duper hurt me and when he was alive um when i can view him from this perspective of love of like unconditional events like i see I see you for your whole life. You are the sum of all these beautiful and terrible experiences. So of course you would act this way. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I think, um, I don't know. It's, um, I think you've summed it up really well. It's like, how can I see you as you actually are? Mm -hmm. And the thing is just like, and, the, and the, like, I guess it's one of those things where like, I expect people to do that for me because that's what I'm doing for everybody else. And then it's also to like, also realizing, um, that not everybody is actually showing you everything. Right. And so it's like, but at the same time, we can only believe what people tell us. So like the, really the invitation here is radical honesty for everyone mm-hmm. because otherwise, um, we're going to continue to, you know, to manipulate each other into relationships rather than like being able to truly make a choice of love. Kevin Garcia is one of the most beautiful souls that I know on the planet. He is full of animation and life, vitality, and a beautiful yet refreshing sense of honesty. The way that he shares some of his personal insights and the steps that he's taken to become such a loving, authentic person is so enlightening and liberating for all of us who wish to do the same. 
In my conversation with Kevin, a couple of things came up. He was so honest about sexual trauma, and this is an experience many of us have had. Sexual trauma is something that not only affects who we are as we walk on the planet in our relationships, but it actually can live in our limbic system. And I mean that quite literally. The work of Peter Levine, who studies sexual trauma and traumas of all sorts, but also the central nervous system, has given us some profound insights as to what trauma does for us somatically in our bodies. I like to say that the limbic system is like a sponge holding on to all of the memory of sexual trauma, but also the emotional content, the powerlessness, the fear the triggers, and all of these things combine and they live in the limbic system, which is like a sponge. Bessel van der Kolk, a world-renowned psychiatrist, would say that because trauma lives in the body, divorced from rational thinking and rational language, the body's only option is to keep reliving the trauma. This is why for many of us, sexual trauma creates a lot of difficulty and challenge in the bedroom and in those special intimate moments. In this sponge, the body remembers what happened and when it happened and what the scenario looked like, and the body will relive the trauma, making sex and sexual vulnerability, if not challenging, impossible. Thankfully, we have many ways of treating sexual trauma and anxiety. It's something called EMDR, and it's one of my favorite treatment modalities. To bring a short summary of what EMDR does in the body, it turns on the limbic system. In other words, it activates that sponge so that together we can begin purging it. It's like squeezing the sponge and watching all of the content drip out for the last time so that in your sexual and relational life, you can flow the way that you want to. It changed my life. One of the more fascinating things about trauma in the body is that Trauma doesn't consist of only the catastrophes that we live through. In psychology, it's kind of a little kitschy and and research doesn't quite support it necessarily, but we talk of big T's and little T's. In other words, big traumas and little traumas. Sometimes little traumas are so insidious and chronic that they can create more of a relational dynamic, more of what I would call an identity distortion, because these traumas happen every day, all the time, and they usually shift who we think we are in the world and who we see ourselves as valuable beings in relationships. But these chronic, small grade, but yet powerful traumas shift the way that we feel about our own desire. Kevin mentioned something so beautiful when he said that he, as a child, desired to fall in love with someone who looked like him. In other words, someone of the same gender. And when a chronic trauma happens around that desire over and over and over again. Something that might say something like, I shouldn't want to fall in love with someone of the same gender. It's wrong for me to desire affection from them. It's wrong for me to want to be held or protected or seen as desirable by someone of the same gender. When those chronic traumas live in our limbic system, it is so easy for us to internalize a sense of ambivalence. I want this so desperately, yet keep it from me because it's dirty. I'm so ready for it right now, but hold off. Maybe tomorrow it'll feel better. I need it right now, but don't give it to me. This type of ambivalence lives inside of our bodies, and it can affect us on the day-to-day. These types of traumas obviously shift how we see ourselves in relationships. Something like, I am deviant, or I am wrong, or I am damaged. And although when we come out, we do a lot of reconciliation work to repair these voices, these narratives in our bodies, they still secretly and subtly play themselves out in the background of our lives, and they help shift the way that we move. They help us make decisions as we navigate on the planet. And sometimes we create a life that we don't really enjoy. We wonder what it takes to make love work. And we wonder why we're not so good at it sometimes. And maybe it's because we're carrying around all of these accumulated little traumas that take up more space in our body than a major catastrophe. 
Maybe it's because over time, homophobia from our community has taught us that we should see ourselves as someone different, someone who is deviant or less than deserving or not enough. These little traumas shift the way that we hold our own desires in our body and in our mind and eventually shift the way that we express them in our sexual lives and in our relational lives. EMDR is not a fix-all for everything, but EMDR can bring a lot of hope. It helps create incredible insights. It helps purge this knowing, these narratives from the body, and it helps repair who we are and how we see ourselves in relationships. Again, I can't tell you enough because it has changed my personal life. Queer Relation Tips is a podcast sponsored by I Am Clinic, a counseling practice devoted to the LGBTQ plus community with in-person and virtual counseling options available. I Am Clinic, create the love lives and relationships you crave. Find us online on Instagram at LGBTQ underscore therapy and Facebook at I Am Clinic. That's I-A-M Clinic.